Kieran Kimball. I'm the president of the University of Calgary uh, Alumni Association, and I have the pleasure of um, saying a few remarks about the Alumni Association, what we're all about, and also to thank and introduce some folks. So I hope you've enjoyed the day so far. Um, thank you for participating in our beta test weekend. Uh, subject to your input, we're hoping to include an alumni weekend as part of our <coughs> annual calendar in uh, future years. So we look forward to your thoughts on the day and uh, grab somebody in who's wearing a red shirt. There's all kinds of folks in red that you can share your thoughts about the day uh, with them. That would be great. Um, so although the Alumni Association has been around um, for about 50 years, at the same time the university started, uh, 50 years isn't really very long in terms of the life of the university. We're a very young university uh, with lots of potential. Our alumni population continues to grow in both size and in stature as graduates mature in their lives and in their careers. <clears throat> One of the greatest contributions uh, that the university makes to the community is the thousands of alumni that graduate from the university each year. Folks like you that invest your time, talent, and treasure in making the world a better place. In the early years of the Alumni uh, Association, uh, we took the lead roles, volunteering for various roles within the university, uh, creating programs for alumni, and securing support for scholarships or other university initiatives. More recently, we've become focused on how to better foster connection and engagement between the university and individual alumni or interest groups of alumni. Your Alumni Association Board of Directors has been working diligently with President Cannon and other senior leaders of the institution to build more frequent and meaningful opportunities for alumni to get and stay connected with the university and the great work that the university does. We have recently create, launched the Alumni Volunteer Program and have created several faculty and interest-based councils. And we have established Alumni Volunteer Leadership Programs in five regions outside of Calgary. On the communications front, many of you will have taken note of the new podcast series, Peer Review, and the complete reshaping of the Alumni Magazine which will hit your mailboxes in the next few days, if it hasn't already. And with events like today, we're expanding programs of interest to alumni, so that alumni have greater access to the hundreds of lectures and panels that the university puts on each year. It's important that the alumni have access to the university's world-class capital. When I say capital, of course, I mean intellectual capital. The university has lots going on, and lots to offer. And alumni also have <coughs> lots to offer. As alumni, we have a vested interest in seeing the university's brand enhanced. What we say about our alma mater matters. What we say to our alma mater matters. How we respond to the university's request of us matters. Alumni have a different vantage point with a perspective that faculty and administration do not. We have an opportunity and a responsibility to respond positively when the university calls on us. And we need to help in those areas where we have personal capacity and the ability to respond. Several years ago, I sat on a faculty advisory committee where the dean of the day was asking several members of the community for advice on how to compete for students with other faculties at the university. The people on the advisory committee suggested that that was the wrong question. We said we thought our kids were going to the University of Calgary, not the faculty of XYZ. Our counsel was that the faculty should not be spending time and energy competing with each other and that the particular faculty should cease to exist and become a department within another faculty. Ultimately, and to that dean's credit, along with other deans, her faculty, among others, was amalgamated into the broader faculty of arts. What we say to our alma mater matters. So when you get the chance, 
to do something with the university, please step up. Now before we continue with the rest of the day in a terrific session led by one of our talented and well-known alumni, Murray Ord up on stage there, I'd like to recognize some folks that helped make today possible. First, I'd like to thank this afternoon's session sponsor. TD Insurance has been a long-standing affinity partner of the alumni program and are here today to show their support of the university and its alumni. Can we please give them a round of applause? <laughs> I'd also like to thank the University of Calgary's Haskane School of Business for its leadership role in helping pull this session together. And I see Jim DeWald back there, the Dean of the Faculty, and Rita, uh, who runs the Alumni Association for the Faculty, so thank you very much. Um, both TD and uh, Haskane have provided us with some door prizes today. And you know, you can't go home with swag if you don't participate. So the way you participate is by entering the draw. I think the boxes, I saw them, they're at the back of the room on those tables. So make sure you fill them out and uh, take home some uh, memorabilia of your participation today. We have a short video to kick off the rest of the afternoon. And then Marie is going to uh, lead a session on changing communities and the future of Calgary from a social, cultural, and sustainability perspective. I'm sure we'll all leave today's session more informed and thinking differently about the world and our roles in it. Thanks again for joining us today. I look forward to meeting some of you later. Have a great afternoon. Calgary. Ah, oh, you'll love it. We're a heading for the round up going to the big stampede. Old Dick Cosgrove riding in the lead. The old chuck wagon rattling, the snorting bucking prongs. We're a heading for the Calgary stampede. smaller group here but uh, and certainly spread out isn't that funny people come into a room and uh, we always want to kind of spread out so I'm going to encourage you to some of you come on move up a little front here we want we've got a friendly panelist here group of panelists and uh, we don't want to feel like uh, we're isolated we're just going to have a conversation and let it uh, kind of go where it goes so if you feel comfortable please move on up and uh, join the conversation so Welcome to the 2015 Alumni Weekend at the University of Calgary. Changing communities and the future of our city, Calgary. My name is Murray Ord, as Vern said, and uh, I have the pleasure of being your host this afternoon. Uh, and uh, as Vern noted, uh, I as well am an alumni of the University of Calgary. Uh, it was a while ago, a number of years ago, that I graduated from this campus. Uh, I graduated with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in theater, and it was a fantastic time for me, I must say. It was really, really great, and it's afforded me uh, a wonderful career and continues to be so uh, in live theater, in the motion picture and television industry, and in live entertainment, both as an actor, as the Alberta Film Commissioner, uh, and as a producer. So um, today I started thinking about um, this campus and this property. And one of the things that has kind of brought me back in this last year in particular, uh, and Vern was uh, kind enough to uh, introduce Jim DeWall, the Dean of the Haskane School of Business, 
Uh, Jim asked me to come in uh, and work with the Haskane School in a fantastic speaker session in the speaker's hour that they do uh, called the Haskane Hour and the Speaker's Hour. And I've worked as an event coach with the speakers. And it's been a wonderful opportunity for me to connect back <coughs> to U of C <coughs> and to this particular campus. And that got me thinking about something that the panelists who you're going to meet today and uh, I have spoken about in preparation for this session. And that was the whole idea of perception, the perception that we all have, whether we're Calgarians or live in another city or, or go to a university. And I started thinking about um, how viciously proud, wonderfully proud we are to be Calgarians. We stick up for our city, we love being here, we love living in Calgary. But I wondered what the perception was of uh, those of us that have gone to the university and how we think of it. I mean, do we really say, uh, after we've graduated from here, you know, do we trumpet the idea that we graduated from UFC? Uh, or would we rather think we should be saying perception-wise something like, well, you know, I got my business degree from Princeton or I graduated from Harvard or in my case, maybe the University of California in Los Angeles in the film and media area. So as Vern uh, said, we as alumni, we have a responsibility to respond to the university and to trumpet proudly uh, where we come from. And we think we can explore that today in a conversation and talk a little bit about it in three areas. The first area, thinking socially, the second one, thinking culturally, and the third one, thinking sustainably. So, without any further ado, let's uh, start with our first panel. She uh, started working a place that I worked at in one of my first theater jobs, Alberta Theater Project. She held a series of roles there, culminating as their special events manager. She now oversees Calgary Arts Development Community Investment Programs. So please welcome everybody, Emiko Yuraki. He's a principal consultant at Project M, a boutique consulting firm focused on growth and strategy services. He founded Spread the Love, a nonprofit organization dedicated to combating Canadian food insecurity and poverty in 2002. Spread the Love has engaged 70 schools, businesses, and NGOs in providing over 350,000 meals across 15 Canadian cities. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Rob Arneson. <laughs> And thirdly, she always likes to enter with a flurry. <laughs> she earned her PhD degree, PhD degree in strategy and global management from the Haskane School of Business. She conducted research on organizational resistance to change and innovation adoption. Please welcome Brittany Harker Martin. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs> A flurry, yeah, exactly. Okay, you guys. So uh, the three of us, um, we've met, we've talked, we've uh, had a conversation about uh, a number of things, but, um, well, socially is where we wanted to really start. So uh, each of you have a lens on that. Um, what's your lens, Amiko? Um, on thinking socially. Around thinking socially. Well. Um, as you mentioned, Murray, I am coming to this from, from the arts, so right. Bachelor of Fine Arts graduate from the University of Calgary in drama as well, mm -hmm. so in theatre studies, and then my work in the world has been in not-for-profit arts organizations and now for a city agency that looks at how the arts is making a better Calgary. And that's where I come to it from, is how arts and how creativity contributes to a Calgary where all Calgarians can make a living and also can make a life. 
And I think that's the key to, to thinking socially, is really about that balance of finding something that means that you're living in a place where you're making meaning, aside from making money or in combination with making money, which we know is important to everyone. But what is it that we can do that allows us to connect to the people who are close to us? allows us to feel included, allows us to feel like we have a voice or expression, and that's really what, what art and what creativity is about. I see you shaking your head, Brittany. What do you, what do you think about what Amiko well, said? I think Amiko's right with the, with the notion of connection and how that's becoming so important in a socially connected world, right? So um, it, my lens that I bring to this comes from the world of research where I use uh, what I call socially empowered learning as a model for engaging students in school and also for engaging people in the workplace. And a big part of that is that the model relies on a group of people working together, but then also working for others. And it's in the working for others and creating social value that they actually become more connected to what they do. So those connections are really important. But at the same time, in, our, in my research world, we're finding that um, being connected to the thought leaders from other faculties and other areas, you know, as mentioned in the introduction, the, the connections that we're starting to see um, between thinkers that used to be siloed is just creating this whole new knowledge vortex that's right. really exciting and interesting. And, and we see this crossover of ideas, um, you know, from the work that I do to the work that Amico does. The, the three of us come from really different worlds, and yet we had all known each other and, and crossed paths before. So. Um, that's why I was nodding. <laughs> so you, you think those, those silos you see that used to be around are certainly breaking down a lot more? Would you find that? I find in, in my world there's definitely two camps. There are people who are really excited about that and embracing that and um, really trying to open up mindsets to being very collaborative right. and learning from each other and cross-pollinating ideas. And then there are uh, people who are digging in and really <coughs> trying to keep those walls and the silos there. We see that a lot in academia. And so yeah. it's a real conversation. Yeah. Um, but I think the real cutting edge forefronting work is happening in the places where the barriers are coming down. That's great. Yeah, that's interesting. I had the same conversation with one of the other panelists earlier about mm -hmm. that whole idea. And, and uh, he said similar things that in his department. Uh, he's seeing more of a connection to the community. But as you say, it's a work in progress, right, as yeah, well? Yeah, it really is. And yeah. I think it's, it's being part of those conversations where you can see the real value. And you can not necessarily do things the way others do, but you can hear how they look at things differently and connect it back to your own. The more conversations you have like that, the bigger connections you make, the more you learn, the more you, you can expand it, and then you take that back into those conversations. Right. Yeah. Rob? What do you think about all this? First of all, great perspectives, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, building upon that, I would have to agree in terms of thinking socially. Well, I guess I should, I'll talk about my lens in a few seconds, but I don't want to forget this thought. Yeah. In terms of um, thinking socially, there are those two camps, and I, so I think mm -hmm. us as an audience of alumni and the broader alumni community, and just as Calgary at large, is we have to consciously decide to what extent and to what degree and to what intensity we're going to be either sticking to the older models, which sometimes is okay because proven models are proven models, or trying to be in the cutting edge <coughs> aspect in, in terms of uh, thinking and doing socially. And so now that ties back into uh, explaining my perspective a bit. Everything bleeds together quite nicely. Um, in terms of my nonprofit experience and, and doing, being involved in the area uh, as a student throughout university and beforehand as well, and still now, um, I'm very intrigued by the connection of, of language impacting how we think socially and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, so specifically, we use the terminology of syntax, the not-for-profit sector or the non-profit sector, and that's focusing on what it doesn't do. It should rather be focusing on what it does. And some language that's been popping up uh, sporadically across the landscape is uh, social profit or social enterprise. And um, so I think that's something we have to be conscious about, not only in the nonprofit sector, but other areas that are heavily uh, or non-heavily social, uh, socially focused. How does our thinking impact language and how does the language impact thinking? We have to be very cognitive of that. Um, I think that's uh, a really important perspective. I can talk all day about this, but uh, those are my you, thoughts you, at the time. Do you think we are socially aware? How I think do you we, think that's going? I think we are inherently, first of all, as a, hu first of all, as a human species. I mean, that's how, why we've survived um, as far as we have. Right. And I think specifically Calgary and the UFC leading Calgary is, but um, I think we just need to get a little more centralized and focused on how we um, communicate how we think socially and how we do socially. 
And that way we can accelerate what we do and we can have that greater cross-pollinization uh, that was mentioned and um, we can think about some other issues in a, in a different light. Yeah, if I can add so, to that. Yeah, do. I, I think that, um, that well, I'm the director of the Youth Leadership Center too. And so what we're seeing is youth are already doing so many things that are social in ways that previous generations haven't. And I think Rob hits the nail on the head where he says we're already wired to do that. So what we need to do is figure out how we can re bring that back into our work lives in a way that's meaningful to those of us who've lost it and bring that back into education because a lot of the things a, a lot of the social value initiatives are just happening anyway because people are finding that that brings value back to their lives but it's happening on the side of someone's regular work day. It's happening outside of the classroom. And if we're actually wired to do that, and my, my research shows that we are cognitively wired to get a benefit from contributing to the lives of others. And what that does is it connects us back to what we do. So if we know this, and there's like 30 years of cognitive research that shows this, why aren't we infusing that into the workplace and into schools? That, that's interesting. Why do you think youth are more inclined that way now than, than when you went to university. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. For sure social media has something to do with it. Do you? Yeah, because I think what it did was it created a different way of connection that was less easy to govern for parents, right? So less adults are setting up the structures, huh. and, and so youth will gravitate to that, um, regardless of the rules about how old you have to be to be on Facebook. We all know kids that are on there, right? And, and even right. Facebook is becoming passe when you're talking about all the other technologies like Snapchatting and, and um, Instagram and all, all of the different ways that youth can connect to each other. And they're also finding um, their people through social media in ways that didn't happen um, 10, 15 years ago where they can create social networks um, of people who are like-minded where it used to be that we were, if you didn't find your own people, you were just meh, hating the place where you were stuck going to school and you just had to suffer through high school until you could get to yeah. university where you had a bigger population of people where you could be right. friends with, right? But they're finding each other sooner. And I think that that... Um, the fact that it happens, the fact that they gravitate towards that shows us that, that they need that connection. But at the same time, it also then says to those of us who are helping um, bring them in, how do, we, how do we draw on their expertise in that and make that something that we can then relearn ourselves? Miko, I mean, you work for an organization, Calgary Arts Development, that, that uh, it certainly deals with all walks of life in this city, mm -hmm. uh, from an arts and theater and uh, cultural perspective. Um, what do you think about this conversation? Do you find uh, uh, what she just said rings true with the, the folks that you deal with? Uh, what, what's your take on Absolutely, I, I think engagement. both um, the, points, the points around sort of uh, a global awareness and connectedness are very true. We're seeing trends too in terms of the, the general population. So many more people are creators now than necessary, necessarily would have identified right. as creators before. There's all sorts of opportunities, whether it's you, know, you can open up Instagram and you're a photo editor, or you can take small videos on Vine and post them up. People are able to create their own content now, which is huge and is really changing changing the way that arts looks for a community. And we call it, you know, from the art sector and from where I sit, we call it the democratization of technology. Right. It's giving people access to being those creators. And, and they have something really meaningful that they want to share. I would also agree with um, the fact that Rob brought up, language really matters now. And what you highlight with your language becomes our shared value. And so that's incredibly important. I mean, we, we also find that art, for some, is a very polarizing word. You know, it can mean something that is for someone else, something that happens in a concert hall or in a theater where it's mm -hmm. dark and I have to dress a certain way. It's not way. accessible. It's not accessible. When you start to shift the conversation to connectedness, community, um, to creativity, these are things that resonate for people. And then these are things that people say, wait, I do that. I sing in a choir. I never thought of myself as an artist, quote unquote, but I, I sing, I undertake a creative practice to connect with people around me who have shared values and common values to me. So absolutely, I agree with everything my fellow panelists are saying. Cool. 
Rob, what's your take on this? You, yeah, I wanted to jump in and be a bit of a rebel here, actually. Oh, good. What I'm going to say. <laughs> um, definitely social media um, is, is part of the equation here. But um, I think that's more or less for now, generation uh, B, X, Y, Z coming up. It's an inherent default <clears throat> aspect of their lives. But more for generation Y, which I'm part of. Um, I think that social media not necessarily uh, plays actually the impact it does. Uh, because when I started my nonprofit as a high school student, and then going into university, and even engaging UC students here, the social media aspect was actually very low. Mm. Um, hmm. So I think uh, maybe my opinion could change two weeks from now, but being here in this comfortable chair, <laughs> my view is, my thought process at the time is, um, we're at a point, especially in the Western world, Western civilization, it's not a matter of survival, and we can start thinking beyond that. And young kids are told they can do whatever they want to be, so then they take that mindset and they apply it to how can they make a difference and they just go crazy with volunteering or um, being engaged socially. Um, so that's my take on it from being uh, involved in the social profit arena for over a decade. Um, so if you look back to, uh, this name may ring a, a bell, Craig Kilberger back in the 1990s, um, that was way before social media. Um, and he's a classic, iconic example of a young person taking a stance Combining, you know, you can do whatever you want and make a and make a social impact. So that's my approach on kind of uh, the answer to why are youth leading the way, and I think they will continue to lead the way. Of course, there's that inherent attitude of um, they're invincible. So that's fantastic. <laughs> well, invincible is okay. I mean, that's not, for the that, most part. <laughs> that's not a, that's not a bad trait yeah. to have as long as you're uh, yeah. realistic at the same time as being invincible. I guess. So. so uh, Youth, you're, you're, you're really reading, uh, generally speaking, youth as uh, stepping up and getting involved, huh? Do you, all, do you all feel that? Yeah, I, I definitely see it in, in yeah. my work, but I don't see that it's happening in structured ways. I think that many youth are just... You don't see, sorry, in what way? In structured ways. Structured. So it doesn't take an adult to set up that situation. Right. I think they're, they are feeling empowered to do it on their own often or pursuing it on their own. If there's an opportunity there, they'll definitely um, take it. They pursue leadership opportunities in ways that um, other generations just haven't, where they're constantly trying to develop and, mm -hmm. and get to a, a certain skill set to be able to make a difference. Um, if they're encouraged to do this, then of course, even more will do it. And, and, and saying that, those are, that is for um, kind of the mainstream individuals who feel that they have that as an opportunity. There are still many marginalized youth who don't, who aren't raised to think that mm. they can do everything, who don't have the um, uh, social justice opportunities that other youth have. Um, that that as wonderful and amazing as Craig Kilberger is, isn't quite reaching yet. Um, uh, that. I think are waiting to for their opportunity as well, and thinking socially or doing things in circles that are that are not yet identified in research. But um, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. Do you, do you think our? Uh, I mean, you you, you highlighted that uh, youth are uh, and are, are getting more involved <coughs> in many many ways uh, and on many levels. Do you think our educational systems? I'm talking generally. I'm not talking about the University of Calgary. I'm talking about education in the Western world. Yeah. Do you, do you think it's uh, keeping up or enhancing that involvement or uh, restricting it? Because I certainly know a lot of youths who go, you know, push this, this education jazz is jazz, and that's yeah. about it. What, yeah, what you is know, your thought on that? Internationally, we have such an amazing education system here in Canada, and yet when we look at the research across the country, the engagement levels start to drop at about grade six, and they drop lower right. and lower, yeah. uh, right into high school. And so, and that's looking at intellectual engagement, meaning kids aren't finding that their work is relevant and that they're not right. feeling like it's meaningful and something that they really want to do. So we call it playing school or doing school, where they're just going through the motions. They've been told, you do yeah. this, then you'll get this, then you'll get this, right? Yeah. You got to stay in. You got to get your A's. You got to apply to this. Wham, wham, wham. That's yeah. what you're going to become. Um, but, but what we're seeing is. In my research specifically, we look at different ways of educating and different ways of drawing youth in. Specifically, we've looked at arts integration and social enterprise initiatives in schools. Those are already happening in some schools where, yeah. they, where the teachers and or the kids that are in the schools have taken up this work, but there's very little research on it. So it's a trend that's happening that the research can't even keep up with, especially social value initiatives. And we're finding that, it's, um, that, that it is definitely intellectually engaging, 
But what we thought was really interesting was when you add the arts to social value initiatives, right. that it actually engages kids the most, which is really cool. So for someone like me with an arts background, I, I was, you know, I was kind of going into it thinking, well, we'll wait and see what we get. It was really ex an exciting finding for me to see that not only do we see that there's value there, but that it's that it can enhance and draw students in. Yeah, it's interesting. In fact, I've heard a similar thing without getting into it, that uh, MBA programs now in the Western world are, are starting to see the value of uh, bringing arts actually into it because uh, for a number of years, you know, a few years ago, uh, companies were hiring these, the hottest MBA students right out of uh, school and putting them in executive positions until they found it wasn't necessarily working because they couldn't think laterally uh, and, uh, or upside down right. or sideways. <laughs> Uh, and or question those things. So that's an interesting comment. Uh, Rob, have you got any thoughts on that or, or Amiko? Well, I feel like Amiko, you're the expert here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I would in. say that idea of, of lateral thinking, of seeing things from a different perspective or a new way is, is key. And I think that's mm. why creativity and arts and, and creative thinking and innovative skill sets are all of these words that are swirling around things like social enterprise and social innovation. And it's because our problems that, and issues that our societies, whether it's Calgary, whether it's a community within Calgary, or whether it's a global issue, are becoming increasingly more complex. And so what you know about complex situations is you can't try the same old best practice and get a result with it. And so that's where creativity and the ability to think laterally and think outside of the box really comes in handy is as we look to tackle these very complex social problems that are going on that have all kinds of levels, whether it's at a government and political level, whether it's a societal level, an economic level, these all require really different novel approaches and multiple perspectives coming to the table as well, which is why you see another whole generation of in the, in the social sector, collaborative work and collaborative strategies mm. coming forward. You know, there's lots of buzz around models like collective impact. It's requiring a group of people to come together around a problem, all bringing different perspectives to the table, but wanting to achieve the same outcome. So absolutely, when it comes to thinking socially, just being able to channel the creativity, the lateral thinking that young people are so incredibly capable of, continuing yeah. to foster it over their education experience, then putting them out into the world with all of these very complex challenges that have been created um, is, is what's vitally needed right now. Yeah, not discourage that thinking, mm -hmm. but rather encourage it, whatever you're in, whether it's Absolutely. the arts or, or business or rocket mm -hmm. science. I think it's the connection to both that's really important because we, we always have this dialogue where we have to tie back the, the rationale for having creative or arts in, in a place has to have an economic rationale, right? right? Well, we're doing this because it makes us better thinkers so we can be more strategic and make more money. But then at the same time, we're finding, and what, and what the, the work that Amico is doing down with Calgary Arts Development is that people need that creative life to have a fulfilling life, and by doing that, they're better at their jobs. They are more creative in the workplace. So it's not an either or thing, and it can't be pieced out that way. It's really a holistic cycle of we need to have a creative society, we need to foster creative citizens, and those creative citizens will create a better world for us to be in that will probably be the richest province in the world. So it's all the solutions are solved that way. And you're running politically. Next. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, last word. We sure. Got the sign. Great. Fantastic. Um, to jump in and trying to tie that together uh, as quickly as I can, I think there's a shift uh, specifically in the academic area. Um, you, we talked about MBA schools thinking more um, culturally or socially, I should say. Um, and now a lot of the top MBA schools or, or business schools are leading the way in terms of integrating corporate social responsibility or social mm -hmm. responsibility into that. So I think moving forward, the U of C has a fantastic opportunity to really um, be even more cutting edge in terms of being social, <coughs> in terms of being engaged with the community. Uh, this alumni direction is an example of that, um, in terms of being socially responsible. So I think um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunities and things are just becoming more blended together. The silos are breaking down. And uh, we have that opportunity as alumni to, to lead the way and um, make everything more multi and interdisciplinary. What a great way to close the yeah, session. We have nice. a great opportunity as alumni. Ladies and gentlemen, Nico, Rob, Brittany, thank you very much. Number two, the panel. Thinking culturally. So, our first panelist, 
Joined the Faculty of Social Work in 1992. Moved out here from Montreal. Prior to obtaining his doctorate, he was employed as a medical social worker and a researcher. Involved in a number of national multi-site research projects, including the New Canadian Children and Youth Study, the Racism, Violence, and Health Study. He's been involved in the Father Involvement Research Alliance and the experiences of visible minority social workers in British Columbia, Alberta, and Ontario. He's worn a lot of hats. He's covered a lot of territory. He's lived in Calgary for a long time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Estee, the Professor of Faculty of Social Work. Hey, David, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I've just met our next panelist this morning, actually. We didn't have a chance to meet while I have met uh, David and Derek previously. Our next panelist specializes in feminist media and cultural studies. Her work bridges analysis of popular cultural representations with media industries, my industry, and political, legal, and regulatory frameworks. Please put your hands together for Rebecca Sullivan from the Department of English and Faculty of Arts. I'm the director of women's studies. Oh, sorry about that. And our third guest. He's a counselor and a psychotherapist, an educator, a recognized speaker, an author, and a writer. He's worked with youth and families and youth at risk for over 20 years across the country and is one of the leading experts in the field of personal and professional transformation. Everybody, please welcome Derek Shirley. Come on up, Derek. Well. Okay, folks, we've uh, had a chance to chat a little bit, but let's just uh, look at uh, your lenses from uh, a uh, perspective of culturally speaking. So. Uh, David, let's start with you. We had to chat so, about a number of things. So, so as you mentioned, uh, a lot, most of my research in the last 20 years has focused on, on the experiences of immigrants and refugees and racialized Canadians. And that's important because uh, typically those communities have not been, uh, have not had the opportunity to really share their experiences in, in Canada. And as a social work educator, uh, it's important for the students that I work with to be cognizant in terms of other worldviews because in, inevitably they're going to work with somebody who's different. Right. And so we have to have an understanding of cultural at a broad level, but at the end of the day, each person that we work with brings his or her or their individual cultures, and that's what we need to understand and work on. So for me, uh, this has been a lifelong passion in terms of, of uh, understanding culture, thinking culturally, because as I was coming here today, I was asking myself, well, who am I? Right. So I'm a, I'm a Canadian, but I'm also a black Canadian, and that has made a difference in terms of my experiences, not only as a public citizen of Canada, but as a member of this university. Rebecca? Okay, well, um, uh, just a, a correction that is worth um, stating because it has a lot to do with uh, what I'm going to talk about. I'm the director of the Women's Studies Program, and that has given me a tremendous lens because people who, would, who take Women's Studies courses, people who um, uh, graduate with degrees in Women's Studies, they're there because they have recognized the harms in our world the discriminatory, the exploitative, and the abusive harms in the world, and they want to make a difference. They want to change that culture. You know, so the lens that we have in women's studies in the contemporary age is called intersectionality, and we use the intersectional lens to understand how 
we live, as David pointed out, how we live in the world, how we accommodate the world that doesn't want to accommodate us, but then how we can be more mindful of that world and the culture that harms the person beside us. How do our unique circumstances of power and privilege, how do we operate in ways that contribute to other harms, contribute to someone else's harm? You know, we need to be thinking outward. We need to understand who we are so that we can be more mindful about our language, going back to the first uh, panel, more mindful about our language and our practices where we're just working through day by day to survive on a certain level. But how can we make that trip a little easier for the person beside us, the person behind us especially? And that's what we try to do. Derek, let's go over to you, sort of your, your lens. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you for coming out it's Saturday afternoon, so it's a sunny, beautiful day inside. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, when I think about culture, I have to think about the fact that we have different, uh, we have different elements of culture, the different dimensions of culture. We can't just look at culture, race, ethnicity, and gender. We have to look at socioeconomic status, level of education, how much money you make, um, how old you're, all these different things. There's mm -hmm. so many different elements and, and um, um, dimensions of culture, not just one singular one. So in every, you all have multiple dimensions of culture. So if you go down the plus 15 on lunch, you're going to see a whole different culture than if you were to walk outside of the drop-in center, right, at the same time of day. Different culture, different experience, different type of engagement. So what culture, what, are, what hat are you wearing? What, what are you bringing into that? So what was mm -hmm. kind of going off of what Rebecca is saying is, is we almost have to, it's not really tiptoe, it's kind of just walk slowly, right? Mm -hmm. I just barrel through and like, this is the way it is, and this is yeah. how it is, come on, this is right. how I got, I got, I got, I got, I got, I got to get this stuff done, I got to go, right? Because we can, we can just run over people, right? And mm -hmm. we do have to have some level of sensitivity, not just to the cultures of other people, to the experience of others, but also have some sensitivity to the fact that we don't know a lot of stuff. We really don't know squat in the big picture of things. Um, this wasn't very long ago that I was racist against black people. This was in my own lifetime. See? So now I'm not. <laughs> so that's a change process. We've all gone through different change processes, and we will continue to go through different change processes. So we need to have these conversations to start off with and at least acknowledge the fact that we really know about this much in the big scheme of things, but at least that's something to start off with. You know, I really want to follow up because it's so, tr so wonderful what you said, Derek, because I think when we talk about culture, there's the culture of personal experience. You know, there's who we are and how we live, and, and then there's this culture. I mean, people have heard about the or you know, our organizational cultures, our institutional cultures, our national cultures. Well, and how many people have heard the words not sure you really fit in with the culture, huh. right? <laughs> so what are we saying? We're saying you need to change. What we need to start saying is that culture needs to change. If that culture can't accommodate Derek's experiences, David's experiences, all of our experiences, and doesn't want to, doesn't want to hear it, doesn't want to learn from it, doesn't want to grow from it, then that's not a culture. That's stasis. Mm -hmm. So we need to be thinking about culture as active, as dynamic, and as always ready to change, to do better, to be more diverse, to be more equitable, to be more just. And we can do it. I think this week in particular, with the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission coming out, you know, there was a great editorial that pointed out that we can't just simply leave the past behind. We can't say, oh, those were different times. There are some universals. The abuse of children was never okay. And yet we made it okay. 
So we've got to live with that. And we've got to promise to not do it in the future. And we've got to say, our culture has to change so that we never, ever, ever speak a language where that was okay. Do you think we're, uh, Rebecca, do you think we're uh, starting to uh, shift that direction and the road that we've been going down and head in a healthier direction? Or do you think it's starting or not? I think informally, going back to the other panel, and David, of course, will be able to answer to this as well. I think that it is changing, but again, thinking about culture in a, as, as structures, as forces, the informal cultures, absolutely they're changing. People are having conversations. They're finding their voices. They're finding their people. They're finding their communities. And we're saying, no, that's not OK. But the formal cultures, the institutional cultures, they're lagging. They're really lagging. And we at the University of Calgary have a remarkable opportunity to be leaders of a changing institutional culture. And and I think we're there. I think we're doing a lot of great work. You know, with people like Brittany and David, we're doing good work. But we need to do better. We always need to do better. David, I see you shaking your head in agreement. You want to jump in here, <laughs> young man. I, I, Come I, on. I certainly do. And I think at an individual level, interactions, personal dialogue, it's important. Um, but I certainly agree with Rebecca that at a structural and systemic level, at an institutional level, uh, there are various forms of behavior that, that uh, people feel either included, but a large segment feel excluded. excluded. And, we, and we need to be cognizant of mm -hmm. the need to constantly strive to break down those institutional and systemic barriers because they, they operate as holding people back. They deny people the opportunity to maximize their abilities and their achievements. So, uh, I'm all for individual dialogue, but... Um, individual dialogue about changing institutions. But we, but we need to change <laughs> institutions, because institutions are slow. I think at the University of Calgary, I've been here for about 22, 23 years, and I've seen some remarkable change, but we still have to push, uh, because as Martin Luther King said, we're not going to get to the mountaintop, but we've got well, we to keep on pushing. Mm -hmm. So, so that brings up an interesting question, um, and um, Vern used the term, uh, um, well, uh, he didn't actually use the term, but it was kind of, David, you and I talked about it the other day, the idea of, of um, uh, universities, not just U of C, sometimes being uh, uh, separate from the community that they live in, right? Mm -hmm. The ivory tower, mm -hmm. uh, up in the hill, you guys teach up here. So let's... Um, uh, uh, let's take pick up on what you just said, and I'll ask uh, Rebecca and Derek to respond. Um, if we really want to make these changes in institutions, whether it's universities, whether it's our community, uh, whether it's businesses in our community, um, how good, uh, how well is the University of Calgary doing at uh, connecting with the community, not just this uh, particular piece of ground? Derek? I can't speak for the university. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, talking, I'm talking about just as, a, as, a, as not so much as an institution, but more as, right. as a, uh, I mean, you guys are part of it, uh, of a community, up here, a mm -hmm. university community. What can How, we do? Yeah. Just what, what, can what we are do? your thoughts? I'm not yeah. uh, Well, I really like my dino sweatshirt, right. so I wear that out yeah. <laughs> quite proudly. Um, <laughs> and by connecting, I mean having these, this kind of a discussion. Yeah. So, yeah. so after, because I did my master's here, and I'm, I'm teaching right now in uh, industrial organizational psychology as, as a sessional. And during my master's, I started a group for students of color on campus because my first experience coming to Calgary from Victoria was a negative, well, not my first experience, but it was probably about like three or four weeks after I had my first negative racial experience right. where somebody yells something out. Um, mm -hmm. So from that, I started a support group for students of color on campus. It grew, it grew, it grew, and grew, and grew. So that was on campus. So after I left campus, there's still a need. Mm -hmm. So all I did was I just transported what I was doing on campus 
And then I started doing it in the community. Started doing uh, public Great. community education, Great. education forums, um, and you know, you always have your student base that you can connect with. Mm -hmm. And I'm still connected up with, with people from the university. I'm still back here and, and doing mm -hmm. different things. So I don't see the boundary. I don't see boundaries between the university and the um, uh, and the community. community. In fact, I think the university in many ways can actually lead the greater community towards change um, uh, because there's young minds and there's and this is where the research is happening this is where this we're learning all this stuff now let's go deliver it get it out there right mm -hmm. get get it out there right mm -hmm. so i think the the university can open up and, and start moving towards and empowering more students and empowering more faculties and the university empowering more community groups to do more things in the community in, in connection with the university. Rebecca, do you think that's happening from the university taking it out? We, we tr certainly, we try. And um, so I believe passionately, passionately, that I am a public servant at the end of the day. Hmm. I have an enormous privilege by being a university professor at a public university. And so I have an obligation to teach beyond the classroom and to learn beyond the classroom. Mm -hmm. I have an enormous obligation in that way. And one of the things that I see at the University of Calgary today, again, um, riffing from the uh, earlier panel, is a tremendous spirit of action from our students. And in a very short time, we had Women's Resource Center, the Q Center, the Faith and Spirituality Center. We have groups, anti-racism groups. We have women in leadership, the Consent Awareness and Sexual Education Club, the Women's Studies and Feminist Club, the Queers on Campus Club. I, I could go on and on and on. These are student-driven initiatives. They're not waiting for the institution, oh my God, if they did. Uh, you know, and then I find out about it and I go running to them. What can I do? How can I bring the institution to you? And then the community calls me or emails me out of the blue. We need help. And my answer has got to be yes. It is my obligation mm -hmm. for my answer to be yes. So if you ever call out to the University of Calgary and you don't get a yes, email me and I'll find you that yes, <laughs> because it is our obligation. And I think that we have tremendous communication. Um, the Women's Resource Center is a wonderful example. That was the visionary support of one alumni member. One alumni member thinking, my experience would have been better if there had been a diverse, inclusive women's resource center on campus. So I'm going to see to it that it happens. And we've got it. And it's wonderful. So think about what it is that would have made your life better as a student. And bring it forward. And I promise you there will be a yes. Because that's our, that's our obligation. That's where we come from with our privilege. Is to give back to you in the way that you see fit. David, I, I, you and I had a conversation the other <laughs> yeah. day about, well, um, briefly about that kind of thing. Definitely. So I'm educated and, and trained as a social worker. Right. And the faculty of social work, we couldn't do our work without having strong community ties. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would say social work and community are synonymous. synonymous. Yes. Uh, and whether it's research, teaching, uh, service contributions in terms of sitting on boards, committees. Uh, if faculty members aren't engaged in terms of social work, aren't engaged in, in terms of giving those contributions to the community, then I would say that they are not effective social work mm -hmm. scholars. Mm -hmm. The other comment I want to make is that, that although the university is well positioned to provide leadership and other types of educational uh, learning opportunities, the community is also uh, plays an important part in terms of our learning because yeah. we can't assume or shouldn't presume that, that we know it all. And so by working in the community, having these ties, we can bring back in terms of what's happening in the community to inform not only ourselves but our students and fellow uh, mm -hmm. faculty members. Yeah, and it's not just a, I would think to 
follow what you're saying. It's not just a, a one-way street of you guys always reaching out. The community also uh, has, can come to you, too. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So it's, it's both ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we are the community, though. <laughs> yes, there you right. go. Like, we are, we're not, we're not it's separate. It's not separate. Exactly. We're not separate. No. Um, it's, I've, I don't know, it's just, if you see something, I found this in, in my own experience, and you've probably seen this. If you see a gap, you can fill it. You can actually do something about it, and it can actually make a difference. Like, if you see that something needs to be done, you can actually do it, and it would make a change. Yesterday, I was having breakfast in Humpty's, and these youth in the bathroom were yelling, like, <laughs> I couldn't even hear my own conversation. I started getting angry, and I brought back my old security bouncer days, and I walk in the bathroom, <laughs> and I think I scared the crap out of them. <laughs> right? well, I said, like, guys, what a family restaurant. Have some respect. Mm -hmm. Right, right. I, I, it's just, I, I take, we take ownership of the change that we want to have. We can't just walk away from it. Like, if we, so, we notice something that's a gap, and we have some knowledge, or at least we know some of the people that have some knowledge, we yeah. go, you got some stuff, you got some stuff, hey, you want to come out? Let's go yeah. do some stuff out there and do some other stuff. Yeah. Right? And whether like, you it's know not that the hard. actual person, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter if you know the actual person or not. Assume the, somebody at the university has got to have this knowledge. And I've had tremendous, yeah. I've, I've had the Calgary Police Services has emailed the Women's Studies program saying, hey, can you help? Yeah. It's like a big roll like, Yeah, I can help. So the institution, one institution can help another institution, but it's really one person asking another person at talking, the end of the line. Talking yeah. and listening. And it's those personal and professional relationships which yeah. are absolutely critical to moving things along. Yeah. Well said. And we're, we're out of time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, our third session. Thinking sustainably. This gentleman was appointed the Associate Director for the Center for Corporate Sustainability at the Haskane School of Business in 2014. And we have uh, Jim DeWald here from the Haskane School today. This gentleman has over 14 years of oil and gas experience within multiple disciplines. He began his career in surveying and exploration, transition to energy procurement and construction management, and progressed into project management. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Milia. Welcome, Thanks. David. Thanks, Mark. Have a chair. And this young man holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in International Indigenous Studies and a Master's of Science in Sustainable Energy Development from the University of Calgary. He's a member of the Kwanlun Dun First Nations in the Yukon, worked with Imperial Oil, Synovus, and most recently Shell in Aboriginal Relations and as well in career relations at the University of Calgary. So please put your hands together for our final guest of this session, Thinking Sustainably, Mr. Christopher Fry. Welcome. Thank you. So guys, Nice crowd here. What have you thought so far of the sessions? Geez, it's uh, great to go last, <laughs> isn't it? You get to listen to everybody first and uh, gather your thoughts and say, how are we going to close this out? Yeah, yeah. and you've you, you got to be really good because you're the closers, man. So, got to give them something to think about. Yeah, right? it's sort of like the cleanup batters, you know? We're expecting a home run here. <laughs> Chris will give it to us. Oh, I don't know. Come back. <laughs> so... Let's just jump off with maybe the first question, which uh, uh, I've asked everybody. Um, what's the lens that uh, you both look through when we start talking about sustainability and uh, thinking that way? Sure. Jump in. Um, OK, well, I think um, you know, I might have a kind of a unique perspective. But sure. um, I think as, as a First Nations person, 
you know, I, I do look at sustainability from, I, I guess, an indigenous perspective. Um, I think, you know, kind of tying in um, a lot of my academic experience here at U University of Calgary, um, as well as my work in the energy industry, um, you know, I'm, I'm really looking at it through that lens. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, when um, thinking about a lot of indigenous communities, you know, I've heard this a lot before, is that um, often indigenous communities will uh, plan for seven generations ahead. So um, thinking about, you know, their decisions and how that will impact, you know, their ancestors seven generations from now. So mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, it's, it's apparent that indigenous peoples have lived in this land for, you know, thousands of years sustainably and, you know, have close connections to the land uh, still currently and, and a lot of um, Aboriginal people still regularly use the land for, you know, subsistence purposes or hunting and fishing, uh, that sort of thing. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of things that, that we can learn from Indigenous communities in terms of how do we live uh, sustainable, sustainable, um, sus sustainably in this, in this land. And, um, you know, I think also uh, things, are, things are changing in Canada and, um, you know, uh, Aboriginal people have, have rights uh, under the Constitution, uh, protected under the Constitution, and we also, um, um, there's certain legal cases that have said, you know, um, we now have to engage, consult, and accommodate with, with um, Indigenous peoples in Canada where we're making decisions about, you know, environmental management or, or resource management. And, um, you know, um, that's, that's being regulated by, by the government now. So I think, you know, we're pretty, pretty new to that. And um, there's also been a, a recent case that ha has looked at Aboriginal title lands, which is, you know, lands that aren't in, in treaty territory. And they're saying that, you know, the, uh, the Crown needs to seek the c consent of nations when they, when they want to develop on territory. So we're seeing a lot of um, conversations between uh, Indigenous com uh, communities and, you know, energy developers. And I think, um, you know, this is a, a definitely a growing, growing area in, in, um, in Canada. So that's kind of, you know, m my, my perspective yeah. on things. Yeah. yeah. David? Great. Well, no surprise, I come at it from a business filter or lens. Uh, probably uh, most of you expected that. <laughs> but I, I will say that uh, what you might not expect is that coming from energy, and particularly oil and gas, yep. that you could be a champion for sustainability. How, how can that happen? And so uh, I want to challenge that notion with you today, that sustainability is owned by one side or another. Uh, Murray talked about perceptions. Yeah. And we live in a world full of perceptions. And um, when I look at it from a business standpoint, I am a true believer of sustainability. And I, I treat it much like we do safety in operations. You don't need a title that has sustainability in the title to, or a position, sorry, that has sustainability in the title to say, I believe in sustainability. Much right. like safety. I want to go to work. And this should always be in the back of my mind. Tying in to what Chris has said in a different form is, how do we think long term while we affect the short term activities that uh, a corporation is rewarded uh, quarterly by doing? How do we get corporations to think sustainability? What does that mean in a business type of environment? So I, I wanna give you, because uh, the, the title of the session was What Are Paths to Sustainability? Uh, a bit of um, uh, dissemination of a position that I hope that you will give uh, some uh, credence to, and, and I challenge you all when you leave here to look into, to say, don't just hear about this stuff. Don't, e even the previous sessions, and then walk out of here and say, yeah, that was kind of cool, and I'm back yeah. to my same old short-term type of activities. But leave and start thinking, how can I apply some of those things? Where am I able to, to produce some continuous improvement? So when we look at corporations, the biggest uh, sort of uh, stumbling block that is obvious is this idea of fiduciary responsibility. I know this came up at a panel where I was with uh, another of the speakers here earlier this year. And uh, this is due to the Incorporation Act that says you have an obligation to shareholders to legally provide economic value. And so um, this notion of doing activities in the environmental social uh, arena 
uh, where you uh, allocate assets to them, uh, has been kind of looked at as a goodwill proposition. And, and that's sort of a business term to say, you're spending money on something that you can't really contribute the return to directly, but hopefully will add value some way. Uh, I like using the example of hiring Michael Jordan to sell Nikes. Right? You're gonna pay him $30 million, he's gonna go out there and show he's wearing Nikes all day long, and we can't really say that led to X amount mm -hmm. of revenues, but you say it's a goodwill proposition that increases the brand, et cetera. So these companies, uh, particularly the energy sector, have done this to varying levels of effectiveness as they try to uh, go back and forth with that struggle of having to meet a legal responsibility to the shareholders while being in regulatory compliance and trying to do more. And they face some obstacles uh, along the way. One of the key obstacles I always mention is uh, capturing a, a, a ton of uh, a GHG that exposed. Currently, regulatory regime says legally you can do that and you pay a $50 uh, dollar, uh, fine and away you go. However, if I were to make a decision as a corporation to install technology to capture that ton, the average going rate for that technology is about $156 per ton to operate it. So as a corporate guy, I have to uh, provide shareholder value. Which way am I going to go? None is illegal, et cetera. But it has an impact on public perception, on what we think, right? And this constraint is becoming stronger and stronger. So what are some business avenues that we can leverage in Canada have been leveraged in other parts of the world where those constraints were much higher, much earlier than they were in Canada. And this is what I focus on to disseminate the knowledge on what has worked in other areas. Because believe it or not, when we do innovation, most of the time, there's always an example of somebody who's done it before, before. Yeah. and who uh, are much smarter. I'm a true believer in mentorship, and my mentors have been key in my career in pushing me forward to be innovative. So um, who we look to uh, most often than not when you're industry leading in a corporation are people uh, who are very good at putting a financial cost on social environmental metrics. Uh, that would be two, two uh, people in particular, a guy called uh, Robert uh, Solo and a guy called Amartya Sen. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. I'm, I'm assuming everybody has, right? No? <laughs> Shocking. Most people have not. <laughs> these, are Nobel Prize, these are Nobel Prize winning economists. And they came up with approximations on putting a price tag on what it means to not do things in a social environmental manner. And they huh. did it in 1987 and 1993, okay? So that alone, sometimes when we look at things, we get so caught up with perceptions and this fog of activity and short-term deliverables that we don't even pay attention uh, to some of these markers. The second person, uh, the, the third person, is the scientific approach. If it's in business, particularly in energy, there's a lot of science uh, anchoring that industry. Uh, and that is Carl Heinrich Robert. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. Uh, after uh, a very famous uh, commission was done, the Brundtland Commission in, in the UN in 1989, he took on the challenge of saying, that's great, that's a, a good document. It's got a lot of emotional push behind it. Let's put some science behind it. And he came up with four causes of unsustainability. They were extraction of things from the earth, creation of things in labs that have effects that we don't know the long-term uh, repercussions for, bad practices, and the ability of people to meet their needs worldwide. Not, not wants, but needs. Not I need a vacation home, but rather I need to eat today. I've been fortunate to live around the world, and I gotta tell you, we have a privilege to be here today to sit here and philosophize about things. There's children that wake up and who worry about what am I gonna to eat today in some of the places where I've lived. And it's important never to take for granted what we have. So in this approximation, it's not only uh, good to say these are issues that don't allow for sustainable uh, operations long-term that will destroy the planet, will destroy us. And think of the Industrial Revolution in England. Nobody would say children working in bad conditions, full of smog, would be something any of us would condone today. But back then, it was OK. And so we got to learn as we go. Um, when I look at each of the markers he, they, they put together, the ones um, uh, that I tend to look at, which are fossil fuels, of course, which fall under that first ambit of production, uh, he went one step further and said, we have to weigh the pros and cons of why we do this. So whether we want to admit it or not, we're all consumers of things. And when we don't have a viable alternative, we become that consumer. 
So for us, making small steps to make things better through continuous improvement from a business uh, uh, filter or lens is where I live every day. Knowing that I can't just say we should do this and assume that we can go from right. down here all the way here, but rather say <laughs> what are the next intelligent steps we can do? And as we put people into that process, how do we influence them to want to be champions in doing that? So a way that we do that is through actually sharing those ideas with people like you and challenging you to say, what can you do in your environment? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's a, and it's a not lot. even you novel or new. No, it's, no, no, but I mean, it's just really. And it's not me, I'm just regurgitating. Yeah, no, no, but it's really, really well said <laughs> and, and really uh, you, you touch on a, on a lot of things there. Chris, what's, what's your um, take on, you know, uh, what David has just said and, 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 and perspective? Um, and do you want to pick up on anything that, I mean, here you've uh, spent time with Synovus, right? And, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, other companies, Imperial yeah. as well, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, that's really interesting because, uh, 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 here you are working for those companies and with those companies. Uh, do you, uh, how do you walk the conflicted line? How do you walk the, the uh, um, uh, realization that we live in this land, we're very yeah. blessed as David says, we uh, um, uh, live in a relatively clean country, a safe country. Yeah. We've not done the greatest job of taking care of the earth, but we've not done the worst job. Yeah. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you walk that line as, uh, as uh, uh, an Aboriginal and a Native and working in, the, in yeah. the energy and oil and gas sector? I think, um, you know, when I, when I first started working for, for industry, that is something I really struggled I bet. with. Yeah. Was, uh, you know, those kind of so sometimes conflicting, sure. you know, paradigms, I guess. And, and um, you know, I really had, I, I feel like I have an understanding of, um, you know, how Indigenous communities relate to the land and, and yeah. the importance of it and, and um, you know, um, protecting it. So, uh, you know, I think at, at first it, it definitely was, was a struggle for me and um, um, I, had, I had actually left industry for a bit and um, worked huh. here at, at the UC part time and then furthered, furthered my studies. And I think, you know, as I kind of um, thought about it a bit further, is like, I, I think, you know, working, working in an industry and working within um, a company is, is, you know, is a way that you can actually create change right. and, you know, um, advocating for, for things internally and, and, you know, it is, um, you know, I think this was touched on a few times that, yeah, it is hard to, to change a, an institution, but, um, um, or a very, very large corporation, but I think, um, you know, I have seen, I have seen little steps and, and I think, um, um, you know, I'm also learning a lot about, you know, how, how a large organization works, but, um, you know, I'm hoping that we can, we can start to uh, do a better job, like within, um, you know, currently I work, work with Shell, and, right. and you know, I, we're doing a lot of innovative things like, um, you know, forming a, agreements with communities and, and um, you know, uh, creating commitments and, and making sure that we, we follow up with that, but I think also um, some of the points that David uh, talked about was that, you know, corporations need to step outside of, you know, the regulatory requirements or what, you know, what they have to do in order to, to operate. I think, um, you know, it's looking outside the box and, and, you know, being innovative and coming up with new ideas. And, and I think it's, it's a huge, in, you know, working with Aboriginal communities, there's a huge opportunity there. Um, and I think so far, um, the government has done a pretty bad job at it, so so I think uh, um, a lot of a lot of co corporations have that opportunity to think outside the box and you know work with um, indigenous communities in an effective way and and look at uh, managing resources together and and working sustainably. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And to, to step up. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you? Uh, I'd be interested to know what your. Uh, um, uh, what the reaction is you get within companies that you've worked with. It doesn't yeah. have to be Shell specifically or, or yeah. Sonovus necessarily, yeah. but yeah. just generally speaking. Yeah. Do you find they listen uh, to you? Uh, are they open to 
uh, taking uh, guidance from uh, you, uh, perspectives from you. I'm not suggesting yeah. you just dive into every idea you come up with. Yeah. But well, I think actually, open. yeah, David and I talked about this before, is that you know, it, um, it, it's one of the largest risks for, for projects in Canada is, is um, you know, how they, they you know, relate with indigenous communities. Yeah. And if they're not doing a good job, then, you know, they likely will have a lot of a lot of trouble. A lot so, of challenges. Yeah, we'll, we'll put it. We'll yeah, challenges. yeah, and and you see it in the media, and and you know, I think um, I think it's something that that we definitely have to look at in Canada is is how are we going to move forward in a positive way. Um, yeah, I also think um, um, what was my other point? Sorry, I forgot my other point, but. Um, yeah, we had, we had actually actually talked about it, and you know it's becoming a, a, a huge risk here in Canada. So, yeah. you agree? Uh, I more than agree. Uh, I had uh, the pleasure of talking to uh, 56 high-ranking individuals in the energy sector and asked them, "What are the tensions that you feel that you think a university could help try to to do research on?" The second most talked about theme was Aboriginal engagement, getting that piece right. The first one, you could say almost ties to it, and that it was risk mitigation and management across many areas. And so when you look at sustainability, it's now being quantified rather than a goodwill exercise, yeah. rather as a risk mitigation management exercise where you're having consultants come at it that way now. Yeah. Where it's no longer how we can create a brand or whatever, it's that you know, you've now been waiting nine years to do something. Is that costing you a bit of money? Mm -hmm. That was a risk that you weren't able to proactively mitigate at the beginning of your project by taking some time and spending some money and doing it authentically. Um, but there is a bit of a competency gap, I'll say. You know, when you look at certain companies, that company is constructed under a certain competency extraction, uh, whether it be uh, building something or providing a product. When you put them, because government does not have a strong regulatory regime, and that government says you have approval to do something, and that company feels, okay, I have approval, I'm gonna start. Oh no, I can't, yeah. oh wait, but I did. Yeah. But what's, you put them in the position to try to do something that's outside of their natural competency. And when they do it, and it comes off as inauthentic, and uh, not done correctly, then it becomes part of the public sphere and it really stops them from adding value where they could have correctly had that governance been in place correctly. In the first place. And we see it in other countries. Um, so it, it's, a, it, it's layers upon layers of complexity. There's no black and white answer. And the quicker that we stop being polarized around a table of black and whites yeah. and start talking and doing things like we are here today, sharing ideas, where the next time somebody's approached and, and told, oh, uh, sustainability, that equates to environmental, blah, blah, blah. And you can say, no, you know, a company can do it too. And there's some that are a little hard are taking up that challenge. Uh, no, uh, I've seen this or I've seen that. I've actually looked at it. And take a pragmatic approach that actually doesn't just naysay from each side, but builds bridges towards creating value in all areas. That's where we need to be. And that's the challenge I want to leave with all of you coming here. And I hope I can speak for the other panels and saying, Listen to what was shared today. Make a decision yourself. Be educated in it. Be pragmatic in going after it if it's a passion. Don't sit ignorantly yeah. by as these things happen in your day-to-day -day reactionary stances. Well said. I can't think of a, of a better way to close that. And, and, and on that note, to pick up on what you just uh, uh, ended with, uh, Derek mentioned a very similar thing to me uh, uh, the other day uh, in terms of these kind of sessions are great, and there's been such stimulating conversation today by all of the panelists uh, and by uh, our guests between uh, discussions. But how many times have we all gone to something like this, said, boy, that was stimulating, that was great. And now, I guess, um, are we gonna have steak tonight or salmon on my barbecue? Do I really wanna, uh, uh, do I really wanna uh, put uh, uh, a dressing on that salad or just have oil and, straight oil and vinegar? And we go away and nothing ever happens. So to Derek's point, which he suggested, uh, and I would ask all of you today, uh, if you want to continue this conversation, because this has been a beta test uh, uh, in preparation for the celebration of the University of Calgary uh, 50 years next year, we'd like to carry this kind of a thing on in a much more in-depth way. If you want to be part of that discussion, we would uh, hope that that's the case. 
Uh, Rita here is one of the organizers of it. If you want to uh, leave your name with us, we can then carry this on now through until next year so it's not just dropped this weekend. Uh, and then we say, oh, we've got to get this together in another year. So on that note, uh, thank you both very much for a very Thanks for having us. Thank you. conversation, yeah. David and Chris. Mm -hmm. and, um, and thanks to all of you for coming today. Uh, it's very exciting, very stimulating to see your involvement in the University of Calgary and the, uh, as alumni and as guests. Uh, and I'd like uh, to ask all of our guest panelists just to come on up to the front here and just uh, wave to everybody. And we just want to say thank you from all of us. So just stand up, everybody, uh, all of our guest panelists, the guests. And uh, thanks very much.